Dave Grohl, it has to feel fantastic to be able to get back on stages in front of huge crowds after a couple of years of the pandemic. Absolutely, yeah. You know, when when the lockdown first started in, I guess it was March of 2020, we had just finished making a record and we had planned this like world domination tour where we were just gonna circle the planet like two or three times and then everything stopped. And it, and it was the first time that the band had stopped, I think in 26 years. And it was, it was kind of terrifying for us because we're not good at um, vacations. So we, we were afraid of having nothing to do. So we sort of filled our time with all of these other projects, but really just waiting for that moment that we could get together with an audience again, because that's what we do. I mean, the best part of being in this band is when we walk on stage and we see the audience and we have that moment where we go eye to eye and then we're like, all right, let's go. And then three and a half hours later, everybody goes home a little bit drunk, a little bit sweaty, a little bit exhausted. And that's that's the way we've worked for so long. So, you know, I, I've been reading the news, waiting for Australia to open for years now. And one morning I woke up about three weeks ago, I woke up, looked at my phone, saw the news that Australia was opening February 21st. I copied the link, I sent it to my manager, and I said, we're going right now. We are going now. And so we set up the gig like that, just so that we could come back, because we've always had such amazing tours here. We have so many great friends here. Um, we love coming down. And that feeling of getting on stage, um, that moment where the house lights go out and we walk out on stage for the first time in years, it is it's hard to describe it's well, it's it's a magical feeling that that has hasn't happened that many times well Foo Fighters played the first show back at Madison Square Garden after it had been closed for about 500 days and one of the amazing things about music is just the way it connects people like there's no way that everyone in that room would have had the same views about COVID and lockdown and vaccines and all the rest of it and yet there was that huge sense of unity and joy about being able to come back and hear live music yeah, I mean, I, that's what human beings are supposed to do. You know, we're, we're not these lone wolf animals that can just wander and be alone. Um, the great thing about music is that it does bring everyone together. It doesn't matter uh, uh, where you're from, what your belief is, the, you know, your, your race, your religion. You can have a chorus of a song and bring 60,000 people singing in unison together in that moment. There aren't too many things that can do that in life. Um, it really is, it's like that communal energy that human beings need so that they don't feel alone, you know? And I think, fortunately, we've been able to sort of facilitate those moments with our concerts. Um, and recently, the Madison Square Garden being a great example, that energy that you feel in those first few minutes is the most rewarding, uh, relieving feeling. You're just like, oh God, yes, life still exists. This is it, you know. You taught yourself to play the drums when you were a kid. What, what did you practice on? Pillows. I couldn't fit a drum set in my room. The house that I grew up in was so, it was small. And so there's, there was nowhere to put a drum set in the house. And my mother was a public school teacher. We couldn't afford one anyway. So I just set up um, pillows in the configuration of a drum set and then would put my favorite band's album on the record player next to me and just kind of play along. And what Which, happened then when, oh, sorry, to know, interrupt, sorry to interrupt, you go. No, I was just gonna say, um, which, you know, lent to a lot of bad habits. I don't play the drums right. I just kind of do it the way I do it. And I, and I encourage people to do the same because that, that, usually, um, that usually makes for a sound that could, could be considered incorrect, but it becomes like it's a, your signature sound or feel. Well, this is, this is like um, in the Australian game cricket because a lot of kids grow up playing cricket in their backyard. And so apparently if you've played, say, against you know, a rubbish bin or a brick wall, it affects your game because that's the kind of you know, technique that you learn. So I assume if you learn to drum on pillows, you probably drum pretty hard. Well, this is the thing. I mean, when I first sat down to start playing on a drum set, because I'd been playing on pillows with these massive marching drumsticks, 
I just destroyed everything. Like I just, I was hitting it way too hard and I was just breaking all the symbols. None of my friends would ever let me touch her drum sets, ever. It wasn't until I actually got a drum set of my own that, um, that I could let loose and do my thing. But yeah, it's like running in the sand. And you know, for a hyperactive kid, I was, I was a complete nightmare, believe <laughs> me. So it was the one thing that I could actually let all of that energy out on. You always loved music when you were a kid and since you've become a, a successful musician, you've been able to meet many of the people that were like gods to you when, when you're a young guy. Let me ask you about some of them and tell us what it was like to meet them. Um, David Bowie. Oh my God. Well, you know, I remember the first time I saw David Bowie in person, um, was at a festival in England that he was headlining. We were lower down on the bill. And I stood in the photo pit and looked at him and it was like seeing an alien. You know, it was like seeing a UFO for the first time. Like, oh my God, it's real. <gasps> that's, the, that's something I've never seen before. And then getting to meet him and, um, and all of that feeling coming down to earth you know, like realizing, oh my God, what a gentleman, what a brilliant, sweet, kind, outrageously funny person. And then I recorded a song with him, this is years ago, and watching him step in front of a, uh, a microphone and begin to sing, and you realize, wow, that voice, that's real. That just comes out of his mouth, that iconic voice. It's, you know, the great thing about it is that it really humanizes everything. Where you're like, wow, that's a real person. It's reassuring. But at the same time, you're like, it's, you know, that's, that's a hero. That's not just another person. That's David Bowie, you know. How about Elton John? Oh, Elton John. Well, I mean, the crazy thing about Elton John, when we met, I was walking down a street in London with my wife and my baby in a pram and a good friend, and we were kind of in this posh neighborhood, and right in front of us, out of some furniture boutique, comes Elton John, and he gets into a car. And my friend goes, oh my God, there's Elton John, oh my God, there's Elton And they look at me and they're like, go say hi, Dave. And I'm like, I'm not gonna go knock on the window and like fanboy Elton John, he's having a nice day to himself. And so we're standing there, and the car pulls away, and stops about 30 meters up the road, and the door opens, and he gets out, and he comes back and says hello to us. And to, I was, I, it was too, I can't even explain how surreal the whole thing was, but I do remember that he had the most gigantic sapphire earrings I've ever seen, and they matched his slippers. <laughs> That's a very Elton John uh, thing to hear. Um, Paul McCartney. I mean, I, le I learned to, to, to play music by listening to Beatles records. That's the bottom line. I mean, I had a, this, this Beatles chord book called uh, the Complete Beatles with it was like a 400 page tome this thing was gigantic and I had those two red and blue greatest hits records the early years and the later years and I would just sit in my bedroom floor this is where I learned everything about you know uh, how to form chords and composition and arrangement um, songwriting everything I learned I learned from the Beatles so meeting Paul for the first time I actually met him for the first time at the George Harrison tribute concert at Royal Albert Hall that they had for George a year after his death and um, the show was incredible and of course Paul performed and we were downstairs in this backstage room afterwards um, and all of my heroes were there and I saw Paul from the other side of the room and I thought, oh my God, I, I just saw his back at first. I recognized his shoulders, you know, from all the movies and all the footage of him running onto in the Yankee Stadium to play a concert. And someone came up and said, um, hey, I'm sure Paul would like to meet you. Are you going to hang out for a bit? And I thought, yeah, I'll, I'll wait around for that. And then uh, I remember as he came up, we were sort of eating these hors d'oeuvres and I was doing my best to not faint or vomit or, you know, scream or cry. So I remember eating this samosa, trying to be cool, like, ah, oh, so we're, like you're on tour right now? What's going on? How's the band? Blah, blah, blah. But I was dying inside, you know? <laughs> and then over the years, um, we've gotten to know each other and he's a wonderful, wonderful man. One of the themes that comes through really strongly in your book, The Storyteller, is just authentically being yourself, flying your freak flag, as you say, and not worrying what other people might think. And so for you, you can be this guy who's a hard rocker, who loves punk music, but then you will happily sing Copacabana or you should be dancing or whatever. Were you always <laughs> like that? Or did it take you a long time to kind of get to that space? Well, I think like anyone, I grew up with my own set of insecurities. I mean, it's just like 
being a teenage kid and putting yourself out into the world, like it's inevitable that you're going to have some sort of insecurity. But I remember having this conversation with my mother once and my mom is such a brilliant, amazing, strong, independent, generous, kind, loving woman. She's such a badass. She really is. I, we still, we talk almost every day. I see her all the time. She lives down the street, but we had this conversation once where she said, um, I was asking her about peer pressure. In the 50s, in rural Ohio, she kind of grew up on almost a farm. And um, I asked her about uh, social peer pressure. And she said, you know, she said, I never used to compare myself to people. I don't, I don't understand why people would do that. Like, just to be yourself and not compare yourself to others. I think that's really important. It's one of the best pieces of, of advice that I've ever been given. And of course, I've passed on to my own kids that you have to be comfortable with the person that you are, imperfections and all. It's just, you know, you should be cool with, with who you are. And over time, I, I, you know, I'm not getting any prettier. I know this, you know, I, I, when I jump out in front of an audience, I don't sound like Pavarotti. I know this, but I'm cool with it, you know? And I think in a way that, you know, that sort of confidence is, is healthy. It's really, it's really helpful. Reading about the way you write about your mother, it, it's just stunning her level of emotional intelligence in her parenting that, as you said, she was this suburban school teacher. She had this son who was always getting into scrapes and needing trips to the emergency room and who came home one day and said, Mom, I want to go on the road with a group of guys much older than me, drop out of school and go and play rock music. And she's always just kind of tried to enable you to be who you wanted to be without in any way stifling it. And, and so few people do that. Yeah, I think that um, because my mother was a public school teacher, she had a bit more of a clear understanding of the emotional sensibilities of a child and um, that every kid learns differently. And, um, you know, there's some kids that do really well in school. There's others that don't. And it's not always the kid that fails the school. Sometimes it's the school that fails the kid. And... Um, you know, the, I mean, the irony is that she was such a brilliant educator that everyone loved. And then I'm her son. Like I was the worst student from first grade on. I just went downhill. It's not like I got to high school and everything went to shit. It was like, it started in first grade. I was just a terrible student. But I think that my mother, you know, she knew the difference between IQ and EQ. You know, there's like the IQ, which is the, the, some sort of, um, test for your intelligence but then there's the eq that measures like your empathy or like your emotional um capabilities and i think that she sort of realized that you know i wasn't a complete idiot and that i was filled with this passion for music and and that there was kind of nothing stopping that you can't get in the way of that when a child devotes their heart and soul and mind and life to a passion like that, you kind of just have to give them love and support and get out of the way. And, and that's exactly what she did. You give me the sense that if your life had turned out such that you uh, were a guy who just played music on a Saturday night in a, in a pub, and that was the level where your career got to, that you could have still been just very happy with that as long as you got to play music in a band that you liked at the pub every Saturday night. Yeah, that was, that was my life. Like, that was my life until Smells Like Teen Spirit came on the radio. Like that was, that was sort of the plan. I, I, I never thought that I would live outside of Virginia. I thought that I would stay in the neighborhood that I grew up in and I had all my old friends and you know, we'd barbecue on the weekend. I was in bands and we'd jump in the van and go play Baltimore, or Richmond or New York every once in a while. Um, there was no sort of, there, was, there wasn't a lot of career aspiration. Because of the type of music we were playing at the time, it was kind of like crazy dissonant punk rock. In the, in the mid 80s, like no one was gonna you know, make their way into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame playing this crazy punk rock stuff. So, um, so it, was a great, it was a huge surprise when, when Nirvana became popular. Nobody imagined that that type of music was going to be um, so huge. But Kurt's songs were so incredible that it just kind of went from there. Kurt Cobain's death obviously was a shockingly traumatic event. 
what was also shocking was the sudden rise to, to fame of that band and, and how almost dangerous it was when it happened so rapidly and how uh, very overwhelming yeah. that must have been for a young guy. Yeah, I mean, we were kids, you know, I think I was 21 or 22 years old. Uh, it's a very um, tricky path to navigate, especially at that age, you know, you don't necessarily have this like emotional sort of skill set or tool set to deal with a lot of the complications that come with that kind of sudden success um, or attention. So I can only speak for myself, you know, I was, I was, I was mostly happy that like, I could finally pay off my mother's house and buy her a new car. And that, you know, I wasn't going to have to go back to working at Shakey's Pizza or the furniture warehouse anymore. I thought, oh, great. Like, now I can just play drums. This is my job. Um, but when things became really overwhelming, I would just retreat back to Virginia um, to be with my family and friends. Because all of that is kind of an illusion. Like, all of that other stuff. The, 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 the you know, the, the, the television stuff and, and the platinum records and things like that. I mean, they're they're flattering rewards but ultimately like the real stuff is over here and as long as you can kind of keep the real stuff over here then whenever that becomes too much you just go that way and i think one of the biggest lessons in all of this for any young artist if they come to the point where their their life is complicated by that other stuff you just say no just say no it's all you have to do it's one of the it's one of the best lessons I've ever learned is when someone asks you to do something and you don't feel comfortable doing it, just say no. It's easy. You, you said you rang your manager as soon as you saw Australia's border was open to say, get me down there. Um, how long are you going to stick around? I, we have to leave the next day. I mean, we're playing the gig and we're getting out of town. I know, believe me. I mean, I have kids I have to take to school in the morning. <laughs> so like to tell them like, hey guys, I'll be back. I'm going to Australia. I, we're, we're coming back in the fall, November, December, we're coming back for more bigger uh, shows that, that everyone will get to see. This is just a, this is just a, a, a surprise one-off um, to bring music back to you and to bring Australia back to us. So. Well, you bring people a lot of joy. Thank you very much for everything you do. It's been very nice to meet you. All right, see you around. Hi, I'm Lee Sales. Thanks for watching this story. If you'd like to watch more of 730's stories, they are on the left of your screen. And tap on the button below to subscribe and get the latest from ABC News.